Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time to clap your paws, stomp your hooves, and ruffle your feathers. Wait a minute. I love that idea. How about some backstage passes? Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, come, on. Yeah, yeah. come on. Make it happen. Come Give on. us some. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. I'll make it happen. <laughs> You about ready? Yes, it's a glorious three-hour finale. You got a minute and a half. <gasps> okay, the director's ready. Talent's ready. Cue the opening. W, w Radio. Your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 584, and I'm here once again not only to help you have the best possible vacation experience when you go to the parks, but I really want to bring you a little bit of that Disney magic wherever you are with the podcast, my live video broadcast on Facebook every Wednesday night, videos, blog, special events, and more, whether it's your first time visiting or have been to the parks hundreds of times. If you're planning a vacation or love the history, details, secrets, and stories, there's something in the show for you because each week I'm going to take you from the parks to the screens and everything in between. And if you're a new listener, thank you. Welcome. Please go back, check out some or all the past episodes for interviews, top tens, reviews, and more. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and find everything else at www.radio.com. So this week, we're going to continue with our detailed look at the history of Disney's Animal Kingdom as we approach opening day on April 22nd, 1998. We'll explore what the opening day actually looked and felt like from ceremonies to celebrities to the first guests entering the park. We'll also give you a virtual tour of the entire park, land by land and attraction by attraction, to give you a sense of really what it was like to be there on opening day. We'll look at each of the attractions, shows, and parades, and how they changed from original concepts to opening day, and how they compare to what we have today. I'll then have the answer to our last Walt Disney World trivia question of the week, and I'll pose a new challenge for your chance to win a Disney prize package. Then stay tuned to the end of the show. I'll have more information about our next upcoming WW Radio virtual meet of the month, your voicemails, a few new announcements, and more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. In part one of our look back at the design, planning, and opening of Disney's Animal Kingdom to celebrate its anniversary on April 22nd, We looked at how Disney, with the help of Michael Eisner and Joe Rohde and a true team of visionaries and specialists in their fields, sought to transform 580 acres into not only something that was not a zoo, but something unlike anything we have seen before or since. This week, we're going to look at leading up to the opening day of Disney's Animal Kingdom in 1998 on Earth Day, as well as sort of a virtual tour of what the park looked felt, sounded, maybe even tasted like, and joining me again is a man who, like Disney's Animal Kingdom, we've never seen anything like it before or since. He is Jungle, Jim Corcus. That's right, and and, and and like the Animal Kingdom, I'm a I'm a wild man, you know, and, and in, in some ways it's very funny we're going to be talking about Animal Kingdom because I had to learn to love uh, Animal Kingdom. Uh, the very first time I set foot in the uh, Magic Kingdom, I was in love with it. I had grown up with Disneyland, so you know there were similarities, but there were t- tremendous differences as well too. But the moment I was there, I w- fell in love with it. Disney MGM Studios. The moment I set foot there, I fell in love with it. Even though it was a, that half day park and it had limited attractions and all of that. I could easily spend a day or or two there, you know, fell in love with it. Epcot, I had to learn to love uh, because Epcot just always seemed um, unfocused and just too large for me. And and what kicked it over for me is when um, 
uh, guest relations pulled me in uh, because they wanted a tour because the Magic Kingdom uh, uh, tours, Keys to the Kingdom, you know, it was, it was doing so successful. They wanted something for uh, Epcot. And so uh, I, I wrote the tour um, Undiscovered Future World. And it was called Undiscovered because I, I don't think a lot of people remember this, but at one time Disney was trying to brand all of its parks, you know, with, with a one word phrase. And so Epcot was that discovery park where you would make those discoveries. So that's why it's undiscovered. And, and as I started to, to research, um, Epcot, I started to fall in love with it because I started to realize why certain things were there, why things, certain choices had been made and, and all of that. And it, it just sort of, made sense to me. You know, I, I had been of that group of, well, this is not the Epcot that Walt Disney wanted. This is not the Walt, uh, the Epcot that Walt Disney had told us about, you know, and, uh, so I learned to, to love that animal kingdom, the same thing. The, the first time, um, cause I was working at Disney when, uh, um, animal kingdom opened and, uh, I went there and I was, underwhelmed you know i i was not uh impressed it, it, if anything i i was uh uh very confused because it, it was completely different than any other uh disney uh, uh theme park and and again a lot of the theme parks are uh you know defined by their their architecture you know whether it's um magic kingdom with you know the castle and Space Mountain and, and Splash Mountain and Haunted Mansion and all that, you know, you have all that architecture that helps, you know, define the story that didn't exist at, at Animal Kingdom. There was, there was an awful lot of landscaping and it wasn't like the landscaping I was used to at any other Disney uh, theme park. It, it was wild and it was untamed and it was blocking my vision of, 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 of things you know, and uh, so it it took me a while to go. What is this? <laughs> well, which is Blade. almost what, which is sort of what they wanted you to feel, but in a more positive way, right? They wanted you to feel like, what is this wild landscaping? What is the like? I can't see a castle. I can't see the things. It was so unlike anything mm -hmm. we'd experienced before. Look, it was very. It's very easy to walk into Magic Kingdom and fall in love, right? It's the castle, it's the music, it's the characters and the stories. Mm -hmm. I loved Epcot as a kid. I, re I literally, I don't know why this sticks in my mind. I remember telling my dad, I think it was like the first year that it opened, I said, yeah, I think Epcot is my favorite park. And he looked at me and he's like, "How? how is Epcot your favorite park? And I said, I just love all the new technology and everything is just so new and it's so different and you know, Hollywood's MGM studios brought us into, again, these, these stories and these movies that we had fallen it, in love with. Not just movies, but the classic movies, you yeah. know, the classic Hollywood. Yes. But animal kingdom, it really was an sort of, we keep talking about it being not a zoo. It wasn't a traditional zoo. So when you walked in, you were a little bit confused and, and look, discovery Island and the Oasis was, that's by design, right? There, there was very mm -hmm. little, if any, signage. There was a lot of meandering, and there still are meandering pathways where they almost want or invite you to get a little bit lost. They don't want you to make that dash to splash or race to space or an arc. In this case, you know, the race over to, you know, uh, or Pandora or to Expedition Everest. They wanted you to take the time, and we'll talk even about how, you know, the Oasis changed um, from what some of the original concepts were to what it ended up being because it would have I think at one point it would have been even a more confusing <laughs> entrance to the park <laughs> than it already was um, but as well, you, know, well, you, you know even Epcot uh, uh, was was confusing for um, uh, some people when it first opened I I, I remember uh, you know uh, pulling up uh, uh, news clips from the opening of Epcot and, and most of the commentators were already making fun of the name, you know, what is an Epcot, you know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you know, inter interviewing dream finder and saying, so are you like the Mickey mouse of Epcot? <laughs> is, is, 
<laughs> is that what you are? You know, and uh, so, yeah, there there wasn't that understanding, but uh, I, I think people quickly came to, you know, uh, get, you know, uh, what it was or what it was uh, supposed to be and, and, and the foundations. And, and with Animal Kingdom, I, I think a lot of people have, uh, including myself, ha- have come around, you know, to, well, instead of my coming in with, you know, preconceived ideas, what what is actually there, you know, that, that I should uh, uh, take a look at. And, and again, that, that all started uh, on uh, uh, Earth Day, April 22nd, 1998. And, uh, you know, people were just so excited that there was going to be a new uh, Disney theme park. I, I was working at the time um, at uh, Disney Institute as an animation instructor, and uh, some of the people that I had worked with at the Institute had left, you know, because they wanted to be part of the opening day uh, uh, team of Animal Kingdom. And, and I, I tried to counsel them not to do that, you know, that, that Disney Institute was going to be around forever. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 what a great job it is and you know you, you have you know just to go because there's something new that's opening that that doesn't seem to make much sense um so it, it just a, just another example of the many wrong choices <laughs> i made in my life uh over the years but uh yeah uh animal kingdom opening day uh, uh, was so exciting for people that just like Every other, you know, um, Walt Disney World um, uh, theme park opening, uh, there were people who were parked in their cars sleeping overnight so that they could be the first ones into the park, you know, and and the park was scheduled to open at 7 a.m., but there were so many people in line already. We're talking thousands of, of people that they opened the the park unexpectedly. They opened it one hour early, six o'clock in the morning, so that guests could come in. And in fact, the park filled so quickly that by nine o'clock that morning, they closed the turnstiles. Uh, unless unless you happen to be a uh, resort guest, and if you were, you could prove you were a resort guest. They would. Uh, squeeze you in. So uh, they estimated that that first day there was uh, uh, over 28,000 uh, paying guests there, as well as uh, 5,000 media journalists. Uh, and, and apparently Lou Mangiello was not among that uh, that group there. The, that was, the I, was Mon- still, I was still, you know, I was still a lowly lawyer in New Jersey back then, so... Yeah, Actually, the, yeah lawyer, the, the, the Lou Mangiello yet. we all know and love just did not exist. I was know? still in school. Yeah, I was still in school. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you talk about these gala openings and you know, now we're used to guests waiting outside the turnstiles, you know, at the five, you know, they say uh, they were there at six o'clock in the morning. The people who are waiting online for Rise of Resistance are like, you know, hold my latte because they're there you know, at four o'clock in the morning. But in addition mm-hmm. to the 5000 media, there was like a total of 14000 corporate partners and travel agents and celebrities like Michael J. Fox was there and Drew Carey, Stevie Wonder, David Copperfield, of course, Jane Goodall happened to be there. Um, Good Morning America was broadcasting live Mm -hmm. with Regis and Kelly right from the park. Um, They filmed an episode of Sabrina the Teenage Witch called Disney World. Actually, that that had been filmed a couple of days earlier, but it ran on the day that Animal Kingdom opened. And and they did a a primetime special. And look, I gosh, I miss... (laughs) like I think many of us, some of the specials that used to air, either it was Disney Channel or in this case, ABC, they did a two-hour primetime special about the making of Animal Kingdom as part of the wonderful world Mm -hmm. of Disney right before it opened. So even for people who weren't there, there was a huge amount of hype and buzz about this, you know, before the gates even opened. Yeah, and, and, and the first guests were greeted with rose petal confetti. And there were, um, two dozen African drummers and there was a uh, choir uh, of, of 500 singers chanting in Zulu. Mm-hmm. 
And there was a backdrop of 1,500 costumed Disney cast members. Uh, and and uh, besides the costume Disney cast members, they had uh, uh, some costume performers that had these gigantic uh, kinetic uh, sculptures, uh, sort of puppets of of an elephant and a lion and a triceratops and a and a, a dragon. And there, the opening there was a performance um, of uh, the song "Circle of Life." And it was led by uh, Grammy Award winner uh, Lee Boehm, you know, uh, who, we, who we know from uh, uh, The Lion King on uh, uh, Broadway. And, and in fact, one of the reasons I was not there is because that evening at the Disney Institute, um, Lee Boehm was a guest speaker at the Disney Institute, and I was fortunate enough to be... Uh, pulled as the person to interview him uh, on, on stage about his, his musical work in Lion King and, and, and about Animal Kingdom and, and all that. And, and I know that uh, Disney made a uh, uh, documentation tape of uh, 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 that interview. And if I can track it down, I'll try to get it uh, uh, transcribed so that... Uh, uh, people uh, can hear uh, can hear it. You know, I, I, gosh, that was 22 years ago. I, <laughs> I, I can't even remember what I asked him or, or what he said. But um, you know, the the park was estimated at costing 800 million dollars. You know, and and again, Disney never uh, uh, talks price because um, uh, they say that's not part of the Disney story. You know, and uh, so it may have been even more than eight hundred million dollars, but that was that was the estimate. And what we don't realize uh, today is that um, prior to the opening, there was all of that uh, concern from animal rights groups that you know this is Disney and Disney doesn't know how to take care of uh, uh, animals, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, Disney abuses its cast members. What's it? What's it going to do with a with a zebra and a giraffe? You know, and and so you know they were expecting protesters. So the Orange County Sheriff's Office sent 150 deputies, you know, to to keep things under control. But only uh, about uh, two dozen protesters showed up, and the protests lasted maybe two hours, probably less than that, and there were no arrests. And and it was all very you know uh, uh, unlike today it was it, it was all very you know civil and um, you know uh, uh, Disney I think has proved over the time that it is uh, it takes very very good care of the animals that that they you know they don't go on the cheap they they bend over backwards and and even during this this time of uh, you know, quarantine and confinement, uh, you know, the animal uh, care team is, is still working there every day, you know, to, to take care of the, those animals and and uh, keep them uh, uh, healthy, you know, physically and, and, and mentally uh, there, you know. And, uh, and again, you know, 20, uh, 22 years ago, uh, it opened on Earth Day and and uh, uh, Judson Green, boy, I miss Judson <laughs> Green. He was he he was president of Walt Disney Attractions at that time, and we all thought he was on the on the fast track to take over from uh, uh, from Eisner, and and I think Eisner felt that too, so we got rid of him. But uh, uh, Judson Green was there, and and he said, you know, we purposely opened this on on Earth Day. Because uh, we want, uh, and this is a direct quote from him, we, uh, he, to the media, he said he, he wants uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom to be a living embodiment of that same spirit, you know, which, which I, I thought uh, was uh, uh, terrific. And then the first guests that came in were uh, a family from uh, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Florida, and, and they had slept, you know, in their car overnight and of course as the first guest they got a 
lifetime pass to Walt Disney theme parks worldwide. You know, um, well, you know, one of, of course they that... can't they can't use it today. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but, one of the things I, I liked about the dedication was we heard from a number of different executives and principals, and they each had their own unique take on what the opening meant. And I think they were all ones that did not contradict one another, but actually complemented one another. So Roy Disney, who at one point was the vice chairman said you Roy know just e. Disney, Roy e. Disney uh, right, because right. people keep confusing him with his father <laughs> Roy O Disney who's Walt's brother but yeah, yeah Roy he, E Disney right, who said, of course got his 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 start you know working on the true life adventure films and and so what was it about uh, Roy that uh, you liked there at at the dedication so Roy said and I'm quoting said just as this theme park has its roots in our films it also represents a major departure because once a movie is finished, it's done forever. And on the other hand, Disney's Animal Kingdom, and the, like the animal world itself, will evolve and grow. And it's truly a living thing and something that we're consciously and proudly calling Disney's. And then Joe yes, Rohde... A- a- absolutely. And, and he not only did that, but he also... Uh, we talked about the first family getting you know the lifetime pass. Uh, Roy... Uh, uh, dedicated an honorary first family it it was uh, uh the guy known as the uh, rhino man the the one who had led a, a crusade to boost awareness of the the plight of the black rhinoceros and he had raised millions of dollars for the conservation and survival of that uh, uh endangered animal at the time and uh, he and his uh, daughters were there at uh, a special ceremony at uh, conservation station and Roy presented him with uh, a giant key of life which was in the shape of the tree of life and uh, the Walt Disney Company also made a monetary contribution uh, to the guy's uh, uh, conservation uh, work so you know it it wasn't just words you know uh, Roy E and the Disney Company and all this were uh, uh, doing physical actions to to support you know the the educational theme the conservation theme uh all of this what what a wonderful way to um you know uh kick off the opening of a uh, uh a new theme park and and Eisner read the dedication plaque I don't know if any of the listeners know where that plaque <laughs> is located or have ever read it uh, but Eisner read it, and it said, Welcome to a kingdom of animals, real, ancient, and imagined, a kingdom ruled by lions, dinosaurs, and dragons, a kingdom of balance, harmony, and survival, a kingdom we enter to share in the wonder, gaze at the beauty, thrill at the drama, and learn. And so, you know, uh, I, I think many people remember the dedication plaque for uh, Disneyland and maybe Magic Kingdom. But when it comes to the other parks, I, I think uh, a lot of people just go blank. Animal Kingdom is, is probably the tough. I mean, the other ones are relatively easy to find. Animal Kingdom is, is, is maybe a little trickier. When the parks open again, there's something you can go out and do is find the dedication plaque. But I love what, what Joe Rohde said, right? Because I think he was addressing not only concerns they had in terms of developing the park, but also concerns that guests or people who had concern about the animals said our job isn't so much to control the animals as to control your perception of being with the animals. Mm-hmm. He said you can't make the animals do anything. The challenge is to create a context in which is this is accepted by the viewer as part of the show. So Make it understand that these were not, you know, lion tamers trying to train them to sort of do <laughs> tricks. This was us right. as guests and viewers into the show that they were putting on for us, and I think that conti- obviously continues on today. Yes, I, I think you're you're uh, absolutely right. It, it was a completely different um, uh, perception, and and uh, uh, you know, on, on the last show we talked about uh, Rick Barangi. And and he said, you know, only a company like Disney could do something like this, and by doing it, really will change the culture. Mm-hmm. 
so that people will then get a better understanding and appreciation for what zoos are are are, are trying to do there, and and a, a better uh, understanding that these animals are not, you know, supposed to be uh, held in in you know little cages, you know, uh, for us to look at and go, oh, how how odd is that? You know, and 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 at the uh, dedication, Michael Michael Eisner always thought of himself as a comedian. I, I don't think anybody really got you know his sense of humor, but but uh, to the media, he, he he said thirty years ago you could find on our Orlando property uh, vast herds of grazing animals and some rather intimidating reptiles. Today, after billions of dollars in investment. We have unveiled our most original theme park concept yet. Vast herds of grazing animals and some rather intimidating reptiles. That's kind of funny. I, I, I give him credit for that one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 that's right. It, it's like, what, what is all of this? What is all of this? You know, and, and it was like, yeah, this is, this is, uh, Good and and uh, Barangi, by the by the way, went on to uh, work on Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge, and then he left Disney, and he's now a director at uh, um, the Houston Zoo, the Houston uh, uh, Zoo, and and he really felt that uh, Disney will help zoos market the good things that they do in terms of uh, you know endangered species and all of those types of. Uh, uh, programs. Uh, Judson Green said that he felt uh, that if it was just animals, it would be empty. Mm-hmm. But, but be, be, he hoped that because of the educational elements and all, that the park would go even beyond uh, Epcot, you know, in its uh, uh, educational value. And, and uh, he emphasized that, uh, you know, the reason they were able to attract so many talented people from uh, you know, uh, what was it? 69 different zoos around the country is, um, because, uh, animal kingdom would be delivering an experience that would literally, um, impact, uh, people's lives and change people's lives. Or at least that was the hope. Well, and, and conservation has always been the common thread. And I think the most important driving force, you know, you talked about, discovery for places like epcot and fantasy for places like magic kingdom i think conservation even with the introduction of things like pandora that has always remained the guiding force and principle which is why when people were complaining when they said that they were bringing pandora in there that it didn't fit i says no if you if you if you sort of strip away the special effects and the whatnot of the movie i mean that's really what the movie is about is Mm -hmm. is to pull from Epcot, living with the land and living with the inhabitants of the land and, and conserving what is there. So it very much is in alignment with what Animal Kingdom wanted to be. Now, obviously, you know, certain things change. We talked about how and why Beastly Kingdom never never came to be and how even that and some of those initial thoughts and things that were mentioned at the dedication didn't end up happening, but that has always continued to be sort of that, that North star principle of everything they do in the park. Well, well, every Disney theme park, um, uh, is, is, is a living entity. So, so it continues to grow. It, it continues to evolve. It continues, uh, to adapt to the, uh, needs and wants, uh, of, of the guests. You, you know, they, they always say that, uh, English is a, a, a living language, but Latin is a dead language. And, and the definition for that is that a living language is one that's still being used. And since it's still being used, it's, it's going to change. There's going to be new terms that, that come up, uh, you know, uh, new expressions. Other things will go out of style and, and all of that. Latin is a dead language because people really don't speak it conversationally, you know, so, so the rules and all of that are still pretty, you know, set and, and done that. And, and we always go back to, you know, Walt's famous quote that he never wanted, you know, Disneyland to, to be a museum. And it's not that he disliked museums. He, he loved going to museums, 
but he didn't want it to be stagnant. He didn't want it to be something that was just um, honoring something that was dead, more or less. He wanted it to, to continue to, uh, to grow. And, and I think Animal Kingdom is a wonderful example of uh, how a park ha- has grown and, and adapted. You know, that, th- that first year, you know, as you were pointing out, there were no signs. Mm-hmm. You know, but then they they listened to the guests and signs started to point up. Uh, you know, the the uh, pathway up to uh, uh, Safari Village, uh, which is now uh, uh, Discovery Island, you know, it was kind of narrow. They widened that. You know, so you know, it, different things uh, start to adapt, and and uh, now I think we're going to start that virtual tour of of, of that first year. And I will tell you, those of you who are listening personally, that Lou Mangiello is an outstanding tour guide. And, and I will tell you that uh, every year for a, a ton of years here, uh, there's a, uh, a, a university in Iowa that comes down specifically uh, to have Lou take them through Animal Kingdom. Uh, because uh, you you can hear the passion in his voice, you can hear the uh, uh, accurate information he has in the context that that he has to uh, that he uh, shares, and so um, you're in for a treat now. We're, we're going to take a virtual tour, and and we're going to go with um, and uh, listen. When it comes to Animal Kingdom, I'm not even in the same league as a tour guide as as, as Lou is. So uh, I'm looking forward to this as, as much as you. So, uh, so it didn't mean to set the bar too high no, there. Now the pressure is really on, but I but I appreciate that. And look, we're gonna we're gonna tour together. And that's why I love doing these things. Wait, wait, I, didn't you even do a CD on Animal Kingdom too? I, I didn't, and it's funny that we're talking. Like when we say CD, people are gonna go, "What's a CD?" Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's like a little record. What's a record? Okay. It's a record, yeah, I know. I know. Well, I, I know that you had done uh, some CDs of the um, uh, Disney parks, and uh, for those of you who have a little extra discretionary cash from your uh, stimulus check, you you might uh, uh, want to go to the uh, WDW radio shop and, and take a look and maybe uh, invest in those and, and get a little uh, virtual tour of some of the theme parks. I'm sorry. I, no, I, thought, well, you had, you. I, I thought you had done all four of the parks. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, Jim, I, that was always the intention, right? But but doing a CD or an audio tour of, for example, a land in like Magic Kingdom is mm-hmm. like, you know this, but for those of you who don't, it's like researching and writing a book and then taking that book and then turning that book into a script. And then at, because I was doing CDs, paring down that script so it fit on a 78-minute CD, then going to record the background audio like in the parks and then walk through it and then edit and all. Put. So I love doing it because I, I couldn't scale my ability to take people on physical tours with me, you know, for obvious reasons. But it would take me literally like a year from beginning to end to get them, you know, researched, recorded, because I want to be very thorough and very accurate, obviously. And then production value wanted to be very high. So as I started, I didn't think this out, right? (laughs) So Because I said, well, look, if I do Epcot next, let's just say I do one sort of overall history of Epcot and then I do an overall future world overall world showcase and then i do one of each of the different pavilions that's about 22 or so different cds there's 22 years of my life right there just like <laughs> right out of the gate so i haven't quite figured out the strategy yet other than just when i'm with friends or when i you know meet people i love so, to so, walk so now you tour. decide to do a podcast and when you invite on uh jim corcus we have to struggle to keep it under 10 hours <laughs> yes, okay right. I, I get it <laughs> So, yeah, so let's do it together. Let's sort of walk in together. And look, and as typical Lou Mangiello, before we walk into the Oasis, I think we have to go back, right? We can't walk. We have to we have to take ourselves out of the Oasis because this was critical. Like, this was a critical decision in terms of, because look, look, this is the same thing as, you know, passing through the turnstiles and, and Main Street USA, right? It's the opening scene and sets 
not just the mood, but the environment and I think the tone of what's to come. And before we have what we had now, which is the Oasis, there were a lot of different concepts that were discussed during the design phases of the park. And I think one of the most interesting and notable to mention, possibly because it was somewhat strange, somewhat interesting, and maybe the closest to actually happening was something called Genesis Gardens. And the idea was that the first thing people were going to see in the, and that that archway, that portal that people were going to walk through, much as you walk through the train station on Main Street, you would say there's portals to, you know, uh, Galaxy's Edge, there's portals through all the different lands. This portal was going to be not something that was organic like a tree or a bush or a cave. You were going to walk through a giant Noah's Ark, right? The mm. idea was that the Ark was going to have all these different animals displays moving the story of Animal Kingdom along. And the Ark and the, you know, yes, the biblical tie-ins were going to reinforce how important animals were, but were also this telling the story of how they were saved by Noah, which was, again, meant to tie into this overall conservation message that animals still need to be saved, you know, as they always will be. But this was going to be, like, massive, as in, you know, now the path... Well, it, it, it would have been a huge Noah's Ark, because yeah. you're going to have two of each animal. And if I remember the concept art uh, correctly, you were going to be entering through the bottom of the hull. There was a big right. uh, sort of a hole in the bottom of the hull of Noah's Ark that you would enter. And it was huge, there. like huge as in like hundreds of guests can funnel in through on. So it gives you a sense of just the scale and the scope of how big this arc was. And if you look, and I'll link to an article uh, that we wrote on the WW Radio blog eight years ago uh, where we show some of that concept art. But the the idea was that this, like the train station, was also going to serve as a barrier. Uh, it was going to hide the forest and the landscaping. So you get that reveal, you get that surprise, you get that payoff, the same way that when you walk into Magic Kingdom and you turn that corner, seeing the castle, which you can't see mm -hmm. when you first walk in, is, is the same thing. And the place that you would enter was going to be called Genesis Garden. So again, there was going to be this tropical lush land with with small animals in it and they wanted you to not rush through but literally stop and smell the well they weren't roses but stop and smell some of the tropical flowers mm -hmm. it would have been instagram gold because it was all about taking some of the the different photos but i think some of the issues too jim with this were one um there was concern about the religious connotation and connections right. to Noah's Ark and Genesis Gardens. Um, and, and, and again, uh, the whole point of Disney theme parks is it, it is open to everybody of all uh, religions, all races, all ages, all, all of that. So it, it, it's a, a very embracing type uh, uh, concept. And so, and so the feeling was, yeah, that, that might be a little uh, uh, off-putting. For, for some people. And I think you they also and it's and it's probably secondary or tertiary to that reason, but they also said, well look, there were no mythical creatures on board, you know, the ark, and you really can't sort of connect That we know of. That we <laughs> That's know true. of. That's right. You you can't connect the biblical tales of Eden into these lands of dragons and dinosaurs and, and dark uh mythology. So I, I understand that Although I think I would have been really curious to see how that would have played out and just what that ship would have looked like as the main entrance. And and whether it would be uh, satisfying for uh, guests or not. You know, y you and I have both been, you know, at, at all of the parks, you know, when, when it's uh, that opening hour and people are just rushing, mm -hmm. you know, down the, down, down the streets, you know. Uh, pushing their way through to to get to whatever it is they're going to get to, you know, uh, to some attraction or some reservation or or whatever, you know, and and so being in a park where it's forcing you to take your time, 
might have been a guest dissatisfier. Yeah, and you know what's interesting, too? If you look at some of the other concepts, they are almost on the opposite end of the spectrum to what we have now and certainly what Genesis Garden and, and Noah's Ark would have been. So one of the other ideas was that you were going to enter into this vast wasteland and there was going to be a large pterosaur like perched up on a rock sort of overlooking guests as they walked in, right? And then they said, well, maybe we don't want to sort of have this dinosaur lead in because we're you're where people are expecting to come in seeing lions and tigers and mm. no bears but oh my right yes. because of, right so um there was an idea for a possibly zoo type of feel but again they wanted to make sure they conveyed that conservation mes- message as opposed to the view type of feel um so it was you know trying to sort of figure out what this this right mix was going to be there was another uh, uh proposed concept that you would enter into this village and there'd be all these little cottages sort of dotted around and there'd be stained glass and macrame mm-hmm. and and uh animal statues and a huge grotto there as well um so you know all these different themes that they played around with before they turned to this oasis concept which look the oasis is not for lack of a better term, the sexiest land in any of the Disney theme parks, right? Because <laughs> people walk in and said, well, there's there's nothing to do here. And that's exactly the whole point, right? The, the mm-hmm. idea was that there was nothing to do. You were not supposed to make this beeline, straight line dash. They want, they were very intentional saying they want you to understand instantly. This is a very different place it's going to be and 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 the oasis had all those little exactly. nooks and crannies so you, so you could step out of that main pathway you know to to see uh, and and again they they purposely chose animals that were um uh friendly and and not frightening <laughs> you know to 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 give that uh, welcoming uh, uh feel for right. people you know Right, the animals and the foliage and the streams and and the birds, like those are the attractions in the. You know, there's no, you don't, they're not necessarily on the guide map, but those really are the attractions, the the purest form of nature, right, unadulterated by anything else. Those are the attractions in the oasis. Mm-hmm. And and again, how how tough it is to create something that's never been created before. And make it work. Yeah. I, I wonder, Jim, I you know, and, and maybe this is a question we'll pose to you, the listener. I, I wonder, you know, because the, the Noah's Ark, the Genesis Garden theme was so very far along in terms of consideration, I wonder how people would have reacted had that been built. And you, listener, I'm, I'll post this question in the, the group on Facebook asking you, and I'll share some of the concept art what you would have thought, you know, would there have been this sense of, you know, would have there been a sense of being offended? Would there have been a disconnection? Would there have been something, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see in, in 2020 what the reaction to something like that would have been. And, and uh, I, I haven't seen this on any of the concept art or the planning. When you exited the park, would you exit through Noah's Ark or would there have been exit pathways around? It Noah's would have been Ark. the Noah's Ark gift shop, obviously, Jim. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> I, get Noah's, a Noah bobblehead. Okay, <laughs> it was called Noah's knickknacks, and it would have yeah, it was <laughs> that. It's not really called Noah's knickknacks, just so so nobody doesn't misquote me. Right now. <laughs> listen, you, you've got to be careful because somebody's going to listen to this and they'll, they'll post it on their <laughs> blog <laughs> or whatever, and and before you know it, it'll be in Wikipedia and 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 the whole bit there. So, um, so yeah, so that really was the, um, the, the, the early story of what the Oasis was going to be, that sort of entrance plaza, until you got up to this gradual incline into Safari Village, and now it is, is Discovery Island. Yeah, and, and what you pointed out in the previous show, which I thought was, was uh, uh, very perceptive, was that uh, the Oasis was basically the main street. It was it was Hollywood Boulevard, you know. It, it that that's what it was was to 
to to lead you in. It it was just done in a uh, uh, style of nature rather than than what we're traditionally uh, used to. And then, yeah, go going to uh, Animal Kingdom's version of the hub, which was then called Safari uh, uh, Village, but is now um, uh, Discovery uh, Island. And and from there, uh, again, it would be that traditional Disney experience of uh, a spoking off into uh, uh, different uh, experiences there, you know. And and uh, what I liked about Safari Village, still do, is, you know, there's no earth tones. It's all, all the bright colors, and it's not supposed to be representative of any particular uh, location. So, so you can add in the uh, Caribbean influences, you can add in the Polynesian influences, uh, uh, influences from Mexico, and, and, and again, all of the um, uh, decoration that you have are uh, animals. And and so you know, uh, and this is the place where you're going to uh, cleanse your your palate. So, if you go off into Dino Land, you have to come back to Safari Village and you cleanse your palate before then you go off into Africa or you know uh, wherever. So so Safari Village is that uh, happy, hopeful uh, uh, place there. Um, and and again, as wonderfully themed as many of the buildings are, uh, none of the architecture overwhelms the story. Mm-hmm. They're they're just there, and and you appreciate the building, but it isn't like, oh gosh, that that's my favorite building in Animal Kingdom, it is there in in Safari uh, uh, Village, and and uh, it, it, by this time people are going, well, where are the rides? Well, and I think that's part of the reason why the name changed, right? They called it Safari Village, so people went there and go, well, where's the safari? They're like, mm-hmm. oh, no, no, you've got like six more miles to walk before you can get to the safari. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we hope you you brought your uh, refillable uh, water <laughs> bottle. And if you haven't, we'll be more than happy to sell you. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, there's the, the Tree of Life, which we've talked about before and all that, that you know, hugely uh, uh, impressive, you know, and, and the original idea was that the guests would be able to go up inside mm-hmm. the tree of life. And so, you know, from, get a bird's eye view of the entire uh, uh, park. But now, you, now you're getting into uh, logistical problems and safety issues and, and all of that. But, but they did have a, a transportation experience. Uh, the Discovery River boats, mm-hmm. which which of course are well known for being the very first DAC attraction <laughs> to close in, in in roughly one year, you know, uh, and uh, and some of that is because uh, uh, it it was it was going to give you you know a tour around the the Discovery River so that you could also just like a train, so you could acclimate yourself, you know. Oh look, there's a, a, an iguanodon out there, you know, uh, bathing in the in the water. That's the foreshadowing of the uh, countdown to uh, I- extinction uh, a- attraction. And and uh, for those who remember the iguanodon out out there, they they shipped that off to uh, uh, Disneyland Paris uh, in, for the Boneyard for their uh, backlot uh, tram tour there. But but that that was out there, and it was like, oh look, there's a dinosaur, and uh, you were going to encounter uh, some elements from uh, uh, Beastly Kingdom. So you'd have the unicorn rearing up on its back legs. You would have uh, uh, the kraken, uh, you know, unleash the kraken, uh, a, a water monster that would go, you know, would appear in the water and would go underneath uh, your boat. And in fact, one of the boats uh, had already been um, uh, tricked out uh, with that, so you would feel it rumbling, you know, underneath your feet, as if something was swimming right underneath the boat and would capsize it at any moment. And and there would be a fire-breathing dragon extending mm-hmm. out of a waterfront cave and blowing 
uh, fire, and, and the uh, uh, the dragon would be uh, 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 to save a couple of bucks would be themed after the one that's in the uh, 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 dungeon uh, basement in uh, the castle in uh, Disneyland uh, uh, Paris. There, but as the park approached, there were budget cuts, and so you know. Um, as as you went around, yes, you went by a, a cave and fire came out, but, you know, there was no dragon. <laughs> well, and there was a lot of things that were confusing. And I know that we talked about this at length at, um, and I'll figure out what show it was. We talked about this, the, these, um, these extinct attractions and why the Discovery Riverboats, despite changing name, changing theme, changing entertainment offerings, continue to fail was i think again there was a, a sense of confusion right so let's sort of go back again right so you'd go and you'd yeah, board well yes you take a look at the boats and they look very much like jungle cruise boats and right, once and they you even, get on the boat you have a, a a live skipper who's telling you bad animal jokes <laughs> you know and so you're thinking oh gosh this is going to be like the jungle cruise only this time there's going to be real animals and no it, it was basically one-way transportation from uh uh, Safari Village, uh, in, and the landing was was near Dino Land there, and and then you went to the uh, upcountry landing dock, which was uh, uh, in in Asia, and and this is like a, a a seven to ten minute trip, so it's it's very similar to like um, the uh, the friendship boats mm-hmm. at, at uh, Epcot. You know, if I want to get across the lagoon quickly, it, it's it's better for me to walk than to try and wait for the friendship boat and then take the friendship boat slowly around and well and it wasn't it, it wouldn't stop at the other docks like it wouldn't stop in asia so you'd be standing at the asia dock sort of just <laughs> literally watching the boat go by because mm-hmm. it was it was just a, it it didn't know if it wanted to be a, a transportation you know vessel or was it an attraction was it somewhere in between because you well look when you board the boats like the darting dragonfly and the scarlet flamingo and otter nonsense you're like oh okay. the, the leaping lizard yes <laughs> right. the otter nonsense <laughs> you, you know it, it, you see those names and you go something's happening here yeah. something is something good's happening here i'm i'm not just gonna see hot spring geysers along the shores of africa something else is is, is going to happen you know, and and again, uh, I, I think one of the reasons that caused dissatisfaction with that is that misunderstanding. And so people were waiting in line. Mm-hmm. You know, they were waiting in line for 10, 20 minutes to get to get on the boat. And and so, of course, you're going to be disappointed when there's there's nothing uh, uh, happening. And, and so in November of uh, 98, uh, they changed the name to Discovery River Taxi. So okay, that that'll solve the problem, <laughs> and they re- they removed the live skippers too. So there was pre-recorded narration, and then what they did is they also put animal handlers on the boats uh, with uh, small animals, you know, because that's part of the education initiative there. And uh, guests still didn't buy it, yep. you know. So a couple of months later, in March '99. Uh, they renamed it Radio Disney River Cruise. This was the weirdest thing ever, man. This and, was and, the and again, strangest you, thing you, ever. Yeah, you you have you have it's pre-recorded again, but you're hearing Radio Disney disc jockeys, and and they're telling you that the music is being broadcast from the top of the Tree of Life. It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. But 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 you know, as a Disney guest, you hear you know a cast member or somebody say something, you go. Well, that must be true because they said, you know, uh, such and such. And uh, after a while, you know, Disney just uh, tossed in the towel. You know, th- this wasn't going to uh, work. And so the, the boats were kept backstage. Two of those boats uh, got relocated to Magic Kingdom uh, over at the Contemporary Resort. And they were uh, repurposed uh, to use for the... Uh, uh, pirates and pals, right, uh, right. fireworks for it. Right, because you could fit like six. I mean, they were big. You could fit like sixty some odd people in the boats, and and they were good boats. They were yeah. good boats. You but know? the, so, the, the, you know, the, uh, repurpose these for, you know, uh, uh, for this to to happen. But uh, but Disney could see that this was a no win 
uh, situation. Well, you I know, think the, because I think the Radio Disney River Cruise was just such. I, I think at first of all, it just screamed the era in which it was in, right? So it's <laughs> it's you know late nineties. I didn't. It, there was such a weird juxtaposition of this conservation. It was peaceful. It was lush. It was beautiful. And then you've got it, like it, it, it was animals. So you're right. not even playing animal. Music. But then you got yeah. like Zippy the DJ, like, "Hey, we're coming to you live from top of the road." And, and you know, Minnie Mouse is calling in. They're playing like "I Had the Tiger" and "We Will Rock You." Like, and they're blasting it. So it was this audio. This. Not a pleasant, an un- audio, pleasant audio, audio weenie that was, dr- dr- you know, making you come over and to see what this was, and then you wrote it and you got off and you're like, what? What did I just do? What did I just wait for? Because I ended up being exactly back <laughs> where I was before. I didn't take me anywhere else. I didn't learn anything. So, I, I th- and it's a shame, Jim, because the views that you got were beautiful of the different parts of the park. And yes, for just a very little while, the the dragon. Um, even you could even see it from a couple of the bridges, like it would breathe like smoke, like in in steam. So you'd see the sort of dragon um, uh, on the the, the yeah, and, the and banks you even had the, dragon the rocks yeah. that were uh, uh, dripping the water from the the stream in Camp Mini Mickey. And then th- there's that um, that secret attraction of Animal <laughs> Kingdom that that never that never was, but it but it was there. Uh, to, to see from the Discovery River boats, and that was the Water Temple. Mm. The Water Temple is still there. It, it, it's located near where the the seating for uh, Rivers of Light uh, is. So, so you can look over and you can can see it. It's right up there. But when the park opened, there was nothing there. There was no access to get there. But there's these huge uh, doors that are on water level, and, and there's a carving of uh, Ganesha, who's the elephant mm-hmm. god. And in front, there's these uh, two lighted columns, which have since been removed. Um, and it was like, was the boat supposed to go in there? <laughs> was there was something supposed to come out of there? You know, and, and uh, it appeared, it appeared on some of the early uh, uh, Animal Kingdom maps. It wasn't identified. It was just, you know... You could see the image of it there, and if you knew where to look, and, and it's still there today. It, it hasn't been removed. Uh, the columns, the columns in front of it had have been removed, but um, the the doorway is still there, and it's like, what the heck was that? <laughs> what were, what were they thinking? What were they, you know? And 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 sometimes that's even worse, you know, that that you tease something, and uh, you know. Well, what was that? What do you mean? What was that? <laughs> yeah, it's right there. You can see it. Look, see, look. Nothing to see here. Look away. Nothing to see here. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Yeah, it it it's it, it's right on the other side of the uh, drop for the uh, Cali River uh, Rapids. And and again, there's no access to this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just there. So it had to be built. It had to be designed. <laughs> And and the only place that when the park opened that you could see it was from the Discovery River boats, yeah. you know. So, but that was the only been... thing unique. Like that was the only you know there was no, you didn't walk off and go, "Wow, I rode this, and here's the value exchange that I got off." I, I, right, I, you know, there wasn't anything that, and I think that was it. They were sort of waiting for the payoff, and there was no, there was never a payoff for it right. um although look i would love to see boats come back on that river i mean just imagine oh, traversing gosh, yeah. that river at sunset just how beautiful that would be well you, you know I, I think people love boats and i think they love being on the water you know and uh but this it, it you know it, it wasn't soup all the ingredients were there but it wasn't <laughs> soup yet <laughs> So, so let's go from here again. We've talked about uh, the Tree of Life. I don't think there's any real need to go into. Uh, yeah, I, I think people are pretty familiar with it, and uh, I, I, I know you've talked about it uh, uh, in uh, uh, in depth uh, before. I, I don't think either of us have anything uh, uh, new to to add to yeah. that uh, uh, experience there. And in fact, probably some of the listeners ha- have stories that they could tell us. <laughs> You know, I think, you know, for me, I think 
And, and we'll sort of, I'm, I'm sort of going in, in clockwise format, but I also wanted to go to Camp Mini Mickey first because oh, yes, yes. I really felt that was, it was interesting for a number of reasons, right? Because of, it, it was so very different than the rest of the park. It was clearly meant to be a placeholder for something mm-hmm. that was going to be there. And it was also meant to, it was meant to be a guest satisfier, I think, for a number of different reasons. Remember, mm. Asia was not ready opening day. Uh, no, Flights no. of Wonder was, but if the, I think the the concern was that guests would go to Animal Kingdom with these high expectations, and twelve o'clock would come and be like, "Yeah, we've done it all." I, you know, yeah, and, there, there, there's nothing to do here. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, they've already gone way over budget with construction of phase one. And I think what they also felt too, Jim, was, yes, we love this idea of conservation and real animals and eventually mythical animals and being able to connect to nature and all that. But we've, I I think we learned from Epcot Center and we also have to make sure that we go back and keep in touch with our roots, which is in the Disney characters. So they sort of built their their version of you know Mickey's birthday land this this short term area with shows instead of attractions and and sort of character meet and greets instead of investing large amounts of money into building attractions that were eventually going to go away so the idea was we would theme this area to this rustic camp up in the Adirondack Mountains and they had streams and things like that and they had figures these sort of little statuettes of you know goofy and pluto and huey dewey and louie sort of fishing and huey dewey and louie are backpacking with 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 daisy there and 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 yes donald is fishing but he's not catching fish his figure there is is pulling up this uh uh rubber boot you know uh uh from the stream there and and you're right it it was a a placeholder because that was again the general area where Beastly Kingdom was going to be. But, uh, you know, uh, Eisner was confronted with, you know, we either have enough money to build Beastly Kingdom or we have enough money uh, to build uh, Dino Land. And uh, the general feeling is he went with Dino Land because um, two years later, Disney was going to release the animated feature Dinosaur, Mm -hmm. which would have, you know... um, uh, CGI uh, uh, dinosaurs, but live action background. And this was supposed to be like a huge hit and this would be wonderful synergy. The other uh, reason Eisner went with, with Dino Land was um, the fact that the Imagineers who were involved with that pitched him the idea of, you've got this great ride vehicle out in uh, Disneyland for the Indiana Jones, mm-hmm. you know, we can have that over here in Dino Land. So it's going to save you money because, you know, the development and all of that has already been done. In fact, the layout of uh, <laughs> Countdown to the Extinction was the exact same layout as uh, the Indiana Jones one. It doesn't over feel in that way. Right, it doesn't feel that way, but it actually is. Yeah, and, and, and the deal was if you build Beastly Kingdom, you're going to be building three thrill mm-hmm. rides and you're going to be building them from scratch. So you're going over budget. This will save you some money. It'll also tie in with that. And, but then you're right. Eisner said, wait a minute, there's not enough that's going to be going on here. And you're right. Birthday land was under, uh, Eisner's, uh, uh, regime and it was built in only 90 days. Mm. <laughs> and so the, the thing was, yes, we, we can, uh, we can do this. And you're exactly right. Where are the characters in the park, right? Mm-hmm. You, 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 are you going to have Mickey the Lion Tamer uh, uh, and Jungle Hunter, you know, standing, uh, you know, in the Kilimanjaro safaris or whatever? No, this is a place, and you can do that. And Imagineers at that at the time had had done that because um, they're always trying to okay, what is the story so that we don't violate the story and we can stay within the story. And so the the story was is that Magic Kingdom is where the characters live. Uh, Disney MGM Studios is where the characters work. Uh, Epcot is where the characters are on vacation visiting their friends. 
you know, like Bell in, in, in France and Snow White in Germany. Th- that's why there was that double-decker bus with all of the suitcases pasted on. They're there on vacation. They don't live at Epcot. They're there on vacation. And at um, Animal Kingdom, it was the characters are here going on safari, you know, to see the animals. So we're going to do this. Why they pulled the Adirondack Mountains <laughs> is, is beyond me. I, I, I've, I've got to assume that it was a favorite of the uh, uh, Imagineers or something like that, because how does the Adirondack Mountains you know, tie in with uh, uh, Pocahontas and Lion King, Well, right? because, because the Adirondack Mountains, you know, it's so nice and cool outside, just like Animal Kingdom. It was just a natural fit to make you feel like you're in the Adirondacks. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I, okay. And, and, and again, the, they're the landscape and the architecture. Even the street furniture had that homemade feeling, mm-hmm. like, like you were at a uh, summer fishing camp. Uh, you know, and you had the greetings trail where, yeah, you could you could find Mickey and Minnie and Donald and all that. And then through random places throughout the land, you know, you you get Chip and Dale and Pocahontas and Miko and Baloo and King Louie. And so you're blending together all these uh, uh, different uh, universes there. And, and you're absolutely right. When it comes to a theme park, the least expensive thing you can do is a show because it can be put together very, very quickly, you know, and it's not permanent. So, so you could move that out when, when you need to. So, so they had uh, those two shows. The, the first was uh, uh, Festival of the Lion King, you know, and I, I don't know if many people remember in the beginning, you know, just the bleachers. <laughs> You know, you want to make the show uh, even less this, expensive. This is not high end seating here. Yeah, don't. If you want to make the show even less expensive, don't build any walls. It was an open air, just what yes. Animal Kingdom either was an open wait, wait, air. Which, thing. which is perfect for the heat and humidity of remember, Florida. Yes. Remember, in MGM Studios where the Hunchback show was like, oh yeah, it was a great show, and it was nine thousand degrees in there because it was just no <laughs> airflow. And 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 then also to 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 save the money. What, what you do is you, you pull in floats from the Lion King uh, uh, parade at Disneyland, you know, so that you can bring them in and, and you can modify them. It, it, I'll, I'll, I'll give them this. They did, just didn't take the, the floats whole. They, they made some, uh, you know, uh, some changes uh, to those to bring those in. And, and again, I will also give them kudos that it wasn't just an abbreviated retelling of the story of the Lion King. But it, it was this tribal celebration. And not only a tribal celebration, but one where you're interacting with the audience. And so you're getting them, you know, to make noises and to, and to cheer and all this. And, and so to everybody's surprise, because um, I had friends in entertainment when this was being developed, and especially when Pocahontas was being developed, and the feeling was, yeah, this show only has to last for two years, you know, and and if it goes beyond, if it goes, uh, if it closes before that, that's fine. But we we want to try and stretch it to at least uh, uh, two years, and you never know what guests are going to fall in love with. And so, Festival of the Lion King got the highest guest, you know, uh, ratings and all that, and and now it's got its own little permanent. The theater, you know, uh, for that. You you never know what audiences are going to take a look at and embrace. You know, nobody in the Disney company figured that Frozen was going to be <laughs> such a huge hit, you know, or that even the Lion King was going to be a huge hit. It, it was a, a, supposed to be a B animated uh, feature, just buying time for Pocahontas uh, to come come out. And and so the other show, of course, was. Uh, uh, Pocahontas and her uh, forest friends, which was originally named something like uh, Colors of the Wind, da 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 da, da <laughs> some <laughs> clumsy long title there. And um, where that came from is that came from uh, the anim- animal uh, education cast. Uh, you know, at zoos, one of the most popular things and one of the things that you do to educate uh, guests is you bring out an animal 
and you share information about that animal and, and people get to see that and all that. So that was the whole purpose of Pocahontas and her forest friends, was not to tell the story of Pocahontas or whatever. It was an excuse to bring out uh, different animals and share information uh, about them. And, and so, but of course, being Disney, you, you put this in a story context. So Pocahontas is worried that forest is being turn, cut down. So she goes to Grandma Willow and Grandma Willow says, remember the uh, prophecy that there's one creature that has the special gift to protect the forest. So Pocahontas then interacts with all these other uh, animals to try and see, you know, what is it about these animals that are special? Are they the ones that are going to save the forest? And then we find out, surprise, surprise, it's human beings. Human beings are the ones that uh, can are the only ones who can protect uh, uh, the forest and protect the animals uh, in the forest. And and of course, Disney's approach is we're not going to train uh, the animals to to do things. You know, like like it. Sea World, they they train, uh, you know, uh, the, the animals to perform certain stunts at certain times and all that. It's like we're going to take what is their natural behavior and we'll write the script around that. Well, sometimes some days the animal just doesn't want to do anything. <laughs> so so you substitute instead of the raccoon, you bring in you know a duck. You know, in, instead of a rabbit, you bring in a skunk. You know, so so the script was constantly uh, changing. So if, if you went there more than once, you, you could see, you know, uh, the middle of the show would be, you know, completely mm -hmm. uh, uh, different. And, and again, you want to save money. So at Disneyland, they had just finished a, a stage show called The Spirit of Pocahontas. And they had invested in this huge uh, Grandmother Willow figure, which was a puppet. Uh, literally, and they brought that there, and then they created a little uh, uh, nephew or something called Sprig next to that, and those are puppets, and I, I don't think people remember that uh, Disney used to publicize these things as uh, puppetronics, mm -hmm. so it was puppeteering and electronics, and uh, again, I had friends in entertainment, so I got to see that the, the puppeteers manipulated these puppets from under the stage, they, they sat in a, uh, like a reclining chair. And, and then you pull along by a rope to get underneath the figure. And then you, you know, you manipulate, uh, uh the figure. So this is all uh, inexpensive, low tech, but by golly, you know, audiences, uh, loved it. So, so again, th this was, uh, a, a show that was uh, uh, supposed to last for two years, because again, the whole place was, you know, uh, Imagineers kept being told as soon as Animal Kingdom makes all of this <laughs> right. money, as as soon as Disneyland Paris makes all of this money, you know, we're going to build Beastly Kingdom, and so Pocahontas lasted there until uh, uh, what was it, ninety seven, nineteen ninety seven. So so you know. You've got to show there another 10 years. And so for for a land that was put together with duct tape and paper clips, uh, this, was, this was something that guests loved. And it really was, I mean, for all intents and purposes, a one-woman show. I mean, it was Pocahontas oh, yes. and everybody else was just, you know, the puppeteers or the animatronics. Uh, they did, I remember them bringing up a, a kid from the audience at, at mm -hmm. the beginning where I think he had to like, make a sound or pretended like be one of the animals or something. And there was these right. colored uh, paper leaves that would blow when she sang color of the wind, but she really carried that show and had to sort of adjust kind of on the fly, depending on what the animals <laughs> would or wouldn't do. Um, but you're right. It worked. You know, it was, you were sitting outside. You basically just were sitting on logs, uh, you're sitting on sort of these log benches. Mm -hmm. I remember. Yeah. Um, I, I, I carved log benches. Yeah. Uncovered, <laughs> you know, uncovered because <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, be, 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 because yeah, that that's that's the great idea in in Florida heat and humidity. It, it's like at the Disney Institute, we had this beautiful, beautiful amphitheater. It was not covered because they were just so in love with the architecture <laughs> of it. You couldn't hold meetings there. You know, you'd be out there in the sun, and the sun would be in your eyes, and you'd be sweating. And oh, America Gardens and, 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 and so the when thing. they made it uh, uh, Saratoga Springs, they just you know. 
gutted the whole thing and made it a, a, a pool, which was, it was probably a good idea, even though, you know, it was nice to have that amphitheater. Yeah. So, so, and for people that are sitting there going, oh, I remember this, but it, Lou, you're wrong. There was a lot of people in there and there was a lot of native. This is not the same show as the one that was in Disney MGM studios. That was no, the spirit no, no. of Poca- it, that, right. that, that, yeah, again, that was the spirit of Pocahontas and you're retelling the, the story of, uh, uh, of the movie and uh, and and I like that show, but oh, yeah. uh, again, that that Beautiful only lasted and music very and... a year, I think. Yeah, yeah, that too. Out it was the outdoor back, the backlot theater, um, which, if you remember, is, is eventually what they took away and they made it an enclosed theater where they used to do presentations and shows for Star Wars weekends and things like that. But mm-hmm. um, I remember Hunchback was there too. But yeah, so very different. Two very, very um, different shows from the one that was in... Well, a, 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 again, one of the things maybe you do in a future podcast is how many Lion King shows are there? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there, there are puppet shows, there are uh, character shows, there's tribal shows, there, there's all... <laughs> sorry, and, and that's just at Walt Disney World. That's yeah. not taking into account the, the ones that were at Disneyland or Disneyland Paris and 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 the whole bit, you know. It, after a while, it's like you know, Akuna Matata. <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> they definitely got their money's worth out of that. So, all right, let's let's move from Camp Mini Mickey. Let's move over to Africa, which I think when the park opened was really sort of the destination land, um, and I think it was the one that was really the most complete in terms of attractions in terms of theming in terms of decor and story because the atmosphere there was not just incredibly authentic um but it was a work of art and i think we've told stories about how they brought in the zulu craftsmen and how they made by hand these thatched roofs and even today jim you can walk around animal kingdom and find that everything speaks right to, to use the eyes of mm-hmm. There's scooters and bicycles and there's the imprints in the ground. I mean, it really does tell an amazing story. And there's an energy there because of the street performers and the street musicians that will often rotate through. You really do get a sense that you have entered this this village and then obviously we know that harambe has has expanded uh, a number of years ago with the marketplace and the food but even at the very beginning um at the sort of the outskirts of the village as you start to approach uh the entrance to kilimanjaro safari the meticulous attention to detail and story i mean we could walk through just animal kingdom and spend an hour or two telling the stories that are being told in everything from the rock work to the, 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 the paintings on the walls and, and, and every, every little nook and cranny helps to tell a story, not about a particular area of Africa, but really an amalgam of lots of different cultures. Right. And, and one of the reasons they went with that is they didn't want to be tied to a particular uh, country or a particular region, because again, there's political implications with that, and you know, so so you create you know your own uh, place, but you incorporate those um, authentic elements. And in fact, when I was a coordinator with college international programs, I, I remember several um, uh, international students telling me, "Yes, that that looked like it was right from my village or whatever." Mm-hmm. You know, there the, there was just a real. We we talk about attention to detail being a Disney difference. There really was that, you know, this is the Disney uh, uh, difference. And 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 again, in the last show, we talked about too how uh, the Kilimanjaro Safaris was more uh, of a heavy-handed uh, uh, conservation uh, message there with uh, uh, poachers and all of that. And uh, again, they found that the story was just not because of the whole experience was just not registering with, um, uh, the guests. And I, and I remember John Hench uh, saying that, uh, uh, Walt Disney once, once told him, you know, if the guests don't get the story, it's not the guests fault. Mm-hmm. It's the way we're trying to tell the story, you know? So we're the ones who have to make those, uh, changes. And, and, and I think one of the things, um, 
I, I miss about that original Africa was the theater in the wild mm-hmm. and uh, a 1500 uh, seat theater. And it's only featured three stage shows in it, its entire life. The, the Journey into the Jungle Book, which was there uh, for one year. Uh, you know, when the park opened, followed by Tarzan Rocks and then followed by um, uh, Finding Nemo, the musical. And so uh, uh, that was it. And Journey into the Jungle Book was a, it was roughly about a, a 25 minute uh, stage show. And again, it, it's retelling the whole story of Mowgli and his his animal encounters, you know, in the jungles of uh, India there. And it has all of the 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 great Jungle Book songs, Bare Necessities, I Want to Be Like You. And and again, as a cast member, I got to go over for cast previews of Animal Kingdom. And one of the things that I desperately wanted to see was uh, Journey into the Jungle Book because it was uh, a show uh, directed by uh, Fran Schoder. And Fran Schoder is, is the is the guy who um, uh, directed uh, Legend of the Lion King over at uh, Magic Kingdom, Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is one of my favorite. Mm-hmm. Disney stage shows of all time and Voyage of the Little Mermaid and and Fran had a background in puppeteering and so he's the one who really is the one who started to bring puppets into uh Disney stage shows and again since Hunchback of Notre Dame was you know oh my gosh I I I would take friends to see that and they had never seen the animated feature but they loved the stage show you know and so I'm thinking this guy's going to, and I'm sure Disney thought this too, this guy's going to hit it out of the park with uh, Journey into the Jungle Book. And and during the previews, um, you know, the masks for the character faces hadn't uh, arrived yet. So you're seeing the actors' faces. And I can't tell you how electric and, and entertaining this was. And then as soon as the park opened, you know, all of the costumes had arrived, all of the masks had come. And once the masks were on, there was no connection, you know, with the audience, mm-hmm. you know. And, and I think even after a while, they, they started to remove some of the masks to try and uh, capture that. And, you know, a, again, very artistic. There were costumes that looked like uh, bushes and trees. And then when the, the uh, person turned in a different uh, direction, it, it combined together to make, you know, an, an animal. But again, it just did not work for an audience. And so in uh, uh, 1999, uh, Reed Jones, who's another outstanding show director, I always want to give, you know, shout outs and credit to, to those people who've really made the magic because they remained anonymous for so many years. Reed Jones came in and did Tarzan Rocks, which was that uh, half hour uh, concert uh, style uh, show, which... Uh, again, wasn't my particular cup of tea, but it, it came in the same year that Tarzan was released, you know, to, to again promote and, and tie in. You know, wh- when you have uh, uh, monkeys on, on rollerblades skating through the uh, uh, audience like Starlight Express, you know, uh, I, I, I will admit, though, that one of the things that I absolutely loved is when Tarzan and Jane do that um, – a uh, little aerial ballet, which very much like the Cirque du Soleil on on the the rope vines uh, above uh, uh, the the stage there, and uh, of course uh, the show ended uh, because uh, Tarzan was going to premiere on uh, Broadway. So you don't want to have, you know, a show in the theme park that's competing with something that's, you know. Uh, on Broadway, especially if you're going to try and uh, uh, sell tickets. And it's interesting, Theater in the Wild is called Theater in the Wild because uh, I think it was Imagineer Alex Wright who was, who was saying this, is because uh, it doesn't belong in any particular land. It, it, it belongs to all of Animal Kingdom. It's, it's the wild. So, you know, you can do... I think that's sort do... of almost why it sits where it sits. I mean, it's sort of technically, you know, part of Dinoland USA, but it really is, you know, it almost sort of doesn't fit in with the Dinoland USA. I mean, it absolutely right. doesn't fit with the Dinoland USA theme. So, anyway. Anyway, uh, uh, I guess we're in Dinoland. 
<laughs> Dino Land. Now, I didn't mean to, to drag us so 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 quickly uh, there, but I, I I was so excited to see the Dinosaur Jubilee. Yeah, and, 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 and I, so let's just sort of, let's sort of take a, a thirty thousand foot view of Dino Land USA because this Jim, this is what I remember people talking about, and I think still to this day was Dino Land for some felt like it was the temporary land, like it was somewhat mm-hmm. disjointed and out of place because we get the theme and the story. And you and I, you're not going to remember this. You and I did a DSI of Dinosaur and, and I think a little bit of Dino Land back on show 259 eight years ago, right? But dis- Eight years ago? I, I, I can't remember what I had for <laughs> lunch yesterday. But this and I idea- haven't left the house. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of what Chester and Hester's Dino Rama was and this sort of kitschy roadside attraction. Like I get it. And I understand the story and the, the idea of trying to insert some whimsy into a place that really did not have any, again, you're not, you're mm-hmm. playing to varying demographics and in, including children, right? Which is why you have Triceratops spin and some of these other, right. It still felt like that was almost the quote unquote temporary land. Like, well, this is, can't yes. be here for long because it almost seems like it was thrown together like a, a carnival, but that's what the story is that they were trying to tell. And, and, and again, they were um, almost telling that story right from <laughs> uh, the opening year, you know, where uh, Chester and Hester's Dino Rama is, is today originally, that was Dinosaur Jubilee, mm-hmm. which which I bet a lot of people don't even remember. Basically, and talk about temporary, this was a large, white, plastic tent uh, <laughs> a, 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 that you went into, and there was uh, a museum-like uh, exhibit. And, and, of course, people went in there because it was one of the few <laughs> attractions that... Uh, Animal Kingdom that had air conditioning, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, had uh, fossils and, and uh, dinosaur skeletons, and 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 they were uh, uh, they had uh, been done from casts from the uh, Black Hills Institute and uh, a, a paleontology uh, a group, and all of this, and they were they were set up, you know, just like you would see in a museum, and and there'd be ferns and there'd be landscaping and uh that first year they had comical guided uh, tours four times a day by people who were supposedly um uh grad students at, at the dino institute you know uh taking you through that and um so you have these uh, uh skeletons and plants and and you have the the plaques you know describing what it is and then in uh 2000 uh, the year 2000, it gets changed to Dinosaur <laughs> Jubilee 2000 like uh, in, in honor of the millennium. <laughs> and and you add in these interactive uh, audio animatronic figures of a mammoth and a saber-toothed tiger. And and these are not skeletons. They're, they're covered with fur there. And, oh boy, <laughs> talk about foreshadowing. And outside... They have a series of carnival games mm-hmm. set up, uh, they, they, and very tacky carnival games. They and at the front of the Dino Land, they have this inflatable purple T Rex and a a banner. And and again, the background story is these are here not just to celebrate the millennium, but the Dino Institute grad students are putting on a carnival in order to raise money. <laughs> You know, and and again, just because Imagineers tell you this is the story, uh, you know, I, I I can I can respond. No, that tastes like spinach, and I'm not going to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and and the the other thing they they had that that disappeared is um, even though Dino Sue is still there, um, named after paleontologist uh, uh, Sue Hendrickson, who who found that. In, in South Dakota, there's a whole story about that and, and uh, legal battles and, and stuff like that. But, but basically, it was um, uh, put up for auction. It was the largest complete Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton that had ever been unearthed. About 90% of the 
skeleton was was intact with 350 bones intact and so it was auctioned off um for 8.4 million dollars it was bought by the uh chicago field museum with dun, 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 uh donations from walt disney world and mcdonald's and as we all know mcdonald's was the early sponsor for dino land usa so part of uh reciprocating for those donations is uh, the field museum had seven people working full time on the bones because, you know, they wanted to get this done and finished by the millennium, you know, to display in the museum. And so uh, to reciprocate for Disney's and McDonald's contributions, they had three scientists um, go to Dinoland USA and there was the fossil preparation Mm -hmm. lab. And so for two years, you could look in through these glass windows and millions of visitors observed this, both in in Chicago and and, and out here in in Orlando, uh, where where this team, you know, removed rock from the bones that were fossilized and uh, cataloged and photographed and made casts, uh, you know, uh, uh, for this. And, uh, I remember talking to one of the field uh, museum scientists who were there and, uh, he said, yeah. And, and sometimes during the day we'll go out and we'll talk to people, you know, and he says, what really irritates us is most people thought we were just actors, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, working on a set because this is a, a science lab that Disney, you know, had created. And, and the other thing that irritated them is Disney p- pumped in the sound of a roaring T-Rex and the paleontologists who over a loudspeaker and they would do this, you know, sporadically and periodically, you know, uh, for that. And the paleo, uh, and th- this guy told me the paleontologist there said that it sounded more like a big toilet flushing <laughs> than, than, than what a, a dinosaur uh, did. And, and they, they, you know, uh, fill any cracks with crazy glue and, Uh, all of this, and they made molds so that three replicas could be created. Uh, And so the original bones were, you know, sent back to Chicago. They were finished, and they were put on display and uh, all of that, and they had security guards accompanying the the bones and all this. This was all a a big deal. And uh, three replicas were created. Two were sent on a nationwide tour sponsored by McDonald's, and they visited you know, uh, maybe two dozen uh, U.S. cities during 2000. And the third replica now stands outdoors at um, Dinoland, USA, near the entrance of the dinosaur uh, attraction. But uh, I, again, I don't think people who go and see that uh, realize, you know, the um, the the background, the the history of that. And and, and you know, we're, we're coming to the end of the podcast here, but before we do, I'd like to talk about one other thing that was there that first year of, of Animal Kingdom and then it's, went away. It's the, the Dinosaur March Juno- of the, the Artemis. I thought you were going to talk about the Carnival Games. The, the, nope. the, the early, the, like, this, I remember there being, like, like, one of those white tents like you set up in the parking lot of the stadium before as you're tailgating like it Mm -hmm. literally looked like they put this together the night before like get a couple of carnival games and throw them in there and charge a couple of right and give people but but, but, but you 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 drop the the carnival that you drop the carnival game so it it looks like you know dinosaurs you know (laughs) toss the uh toss the ball through the dinosaur's mouth or knock down, you know, this or whatever, you know? And it was like, oh, geez. <laughs> no, Mar- March of the Artemis. Be- yeah. Because again, I'm a big parades fan. I love Disney parades. And I also, you know, I'm always intrigued about what works and what doesn't work, you know? And and this obviously didn't work. You know, it, it was originally called the uh, uh, March of the Animals. and People just didn't get it because mm-hmm. you're not going to do animals. You're not going to do animals in costume. Because, again, there's a Disney Animal Kingdom. There's real animals, all of this. So, basically, it was Mardi Gras themed. And the the, the storyline was a bunch of artists got a bunch of found items, you know, uh, sculptors and weavers and painters and all this. And they, they patched together 
these impressionistic um, costumes uh, of animals. And some of the costumes, you could even see the faces of these artists who had made them. And, um, you know, they would go around. And, and again, they used instrumental music like Let's All Sing Like the Birdies Sing and Flight of the Bumblebee and Baby Elephant Walk and and all of that. And the guests just didn't get it. And, and again, the, the pathways are so narrow that you can, the guests can only stand on one side mm-hmm. of the roadway in order to see these figures and these uh, uh, floats like they had a, a, a lion playing a, a xylophone made of wooden gazelle skeletons <laughs> and they had a, uh, a, a queen bee sitting on her honey throne and the other bees are tickling her with flowers and swirling ribbons and all of this, this is a 15 minute uh, parade that winds its way, you know, past Dino land and all of that. And again, sorry guys, no cigar. This just did not work. And Jim, and, I don't and, think and that again, we're properly some, conveying some, just, this was a very bizarre looking parade um this you know you think disney parade you think it's this spectacle of music and characters and first of all there's no disney characters no disney music no all, no right? disney yeah. characters at all right but the it, it almost looks I, it's it's almost like a parade i can imagine happening like in key west like very fanciful and colorful and sort of interpretive <laughs> interpretive costumes of of <laughs> different animals um but it was very yeah, difficult yes, to you're laugh, because again <laughs> this has to be seen to be believed i i can understand how this might have looked good on paper and how the 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 pitch might have been you know all of that but but hearing your laugh uh <laughs> uh lou and and yes comparing it to like a key west uh uh, parade, I, I think, is right on the money. That never occurred to me until you you just said that. But I'm going to show. Wait, yeah, I'm going to show how very old I really. To that. I'm going to show how old I really am. And and you, I'm sure you can find videos of this uh, on YouTube. As a kid, I remember there was a TV show I used to watch called The New Zoo Review, would have these <laughs> big puffy characters. It's kind of like what the parade was. Imagine characters from The New Zoo Review still being a little bit more weird and sort of trippy just running around and dancing and they weren't even singing like it was just it was very 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 strange i <laughs> uh, it, it, it it was and and it, and again you know kudos to disney for for taking risks because not everything is going to work you know <laughs> and and it, it thank heavens you don't constantly keep recycling the same thing over and over and over and over again but again, the the thing with taking a risk is sometimes it's not going to pay off, and and in this particular case, yeah. So so when they decided to come up with another uh, uh, parade, yeah, you you put uh, Mickey and Minnie and all of this in their you know their Jeep vehicles and and all of that because that's what guests want to see. They want to see the characters, yeah. and and so you you were very right when you said that one of the reasons for camp. Mini Mickey is here's a place where people can see the characters and they can be guaranteed to see the characters. And, and, and I don't think we, we fully appreciate for, uh, because you and I live here. So it, we want to go see Mickey mouse. Uh, you know, we were able to, you know, hop in the car and drive to the park and use the annual pass or whatever and get in. And, you know, you can see Mickey mouse. But but for guests who are saving up three to five years and and coming down, it's a pretty big uh, deal to 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 see these characters and get their autograph and get your your picture taken with them and and uh, um, I, in in fact you know the the uh, the group from uh, uh, Buena Vista University that was out here you know in in January there was uh, one young lady who was with them. And her favorite character was uh, uh, Max from the mm-hmm. Goofy movie. Right. And how often do you see Max in uh, in in the parks? You know, I I can't even remember ever seeing Max in the parks. Well, luckily, by golly, the day she was there at the Magic Kingdom, there was Max, <laughs> and she literally started shaking and 
fell to her knees in tears. And 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 they waved Max to come over to her and all of that, and had to explain to to poor Max that he was her absolute favorite character, and in all the times that she had ever been, you know, to Disney, she had never seen him. You know, so of course got the picture taken and and and, and the whole bit. So, you know, uh, sometimes we can get very jaded, and and we re. re need to realize that um, this is a pretty big deal for people. I'm you know, listen, when you Jim, talk I'm, about the I'm Disney sh- magic. I'm sure that somebody is like, Mangello. I loved the blue and green elephants that had saxophones as trunks in March of the Audibles. Like, those were my favorite <laughs> characters ever. Um, you know, I listen. Uh, and well, I, you know, I... I <laughs> that could be your audience. <laughs> that could that could be your. But again, it also reminds me of what I tell people about Disney animated films because I I was always down on um, uh, Aristocats as an animated feature, and I I can I can spend an entire podcast telling you all the things that's wrong with, with that animated film from reused animation to to why do you have uh, dogs from the southern United States there at turn of the century Paris and you know, all, all of that stuff. But, but I dated a, a lovely young woman named Tracy and that was her absolute favorite mm-hmm. Disney animated film. And it, eventually she told me that one of the reasons for that is the weekend that she found that her, her folks were getting a divorce. Her dad took her to see Aristocats. And that was that was that real bonding moment where she and her dad, because she then after the divorce lived with her dad, and so when she sees Aristocats, all of that other emotions, you know, get stirred up and come back, and it made me realize because I I love Tracy tremendously. I thought we were going to be together forever, but um, that every Disney animated film is somebody's. Mm-hmm favorite Disney is somebody's favorite animated film. And, and the same thing with, uh, uh, March of the Artimals, you know, even, even though you and I take a look at that and go, really, yep. uh, that doesn't quite Listen, seem to work. Somebody I'm, out I'm there sure is... there are people out there who are going, that was my favorite Disney parade of, of, of all time. And, and the fact that there weren't Disney characters in it made it so pure and so artistic. Look, and there's somebody out there who's going, man, Stitch's supersonic celebration was the greatest thing since sliced bread. I wish they would bring that back. So yes. you're right. Um, everybody, you know, everything is somebody's favorite, which is why I really don't ever, you know, I don't like to to down anything because somebody might have an attachment to it. You know, so we're talking about March of the Artimals and, and, you know, just having some fun with it because it was just such a very different take on the the parade itself. Um, and it just didn't resonate with fans. They tried right, to add, but, but, but on the other hand, I feel no obligation just because somebody loves that. For right. me to say, Oh, you're right. That, that, that was great. No, yeah. I mean, that, nothing... that was the best thing that Disney ever did. Yeah, I, was... I, 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 I feel I can justify and say, I, I can see how you really enjoy that, but, it just didn't work for me. And they tried. I mean, they tried to fix it. They added more music. They added a storyteller to maybe sort of, you know, uh, weave a story in. Mm-hmm. And it still didn't do it. Uh, you know, there, there's one thing, Jim, though, that we didn't talk about that I think bears okay. mentioning about the opening of Disney's Animal Kingdom. And really for the first... It, 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 it's your podcast. Go for it. It's our podcast. It's all of our <laughs> podcasts collectively. We all do this together. Because I think there was a, a major player in the opening of Disney's Animal Kingdom that we we may not remember, but was very prevalent in one part of the parks. Because lest we forget that Dino Land and Disney's Animal Kingdom was brought to you by our friends at McDonald's. Mm-hmm. McDonald's was a ten year sponsor. Um, they had a, a long a tenure sponsorship with the Walt Disney Company. And if you remember, if you think back to the early days of Dinoland USA, there was this 
wonderful sort of symbiotic relationship where you found not just McDonald's food throughout um, some of the Dinoland kiosks. Right, you, uh, and, and Restaurant Asaurus. And, and Restaurant Asaurus. Yes. But outside the parks, if you went to McDonald's, they had all the Happy Meals that were themed after Disney's Animal Kingdom. All the boxes were decorated. There's a, I don't want to call them toys, they're collectibles now, but all the different collectibles. Action, well, I guess they're not even really not action, action figures, figures, but yeah. Right. <laughs> so if you remember, all the parks at the time had a restaurant that served McDonald's food, right? I think it was just nuggets. I think it was right, only well, nuggets you, and fries. You, you had to be careful there. So you, you had just the fries in Frontierland from the, the, the fry cart there right across from uh, Pecos Bill. And, and so they had to limit, you know, what was being sold. And, and again, they had that uh, large uh, McDonald's down by uh, uh, the All-Star uh, mm-hmm. Resorts. Which is which, getting, which, getting which even they're, bigger. <laughs> they're, they're rehabbing right now. I guess construction on it has stopped yeah. uh, right now during the quarantine. But, yeah, they were rehabbing it because uh, – Disney's middle name is Jello. Everything is constantly changing. <laughs> right. But 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 you're right. McDonald's was the was the big deal there. And then what happened is uh, they because of that agreement, they could only release Happy Meals that had Disney mm-hmm. uh, characters uh, in it. And so when Disney started to have a string of uh, not so successful <laughs> animated films. You know, McDonald's was looking around and and going, "Hey, Burger King is doing Happy Meals <laughs> toys on the on on Shrek and and all of this." You know, we missed out on all of that. Um, and and again, as long as we bring up McDonald's, McDonald's released a Happy Meal that had the purple dragon, mm-hmm. purple winged dragon from uh, Beastly Kingdom that never was. So. Um, yeah, there was uh, even a lot of the signage around the park. Um, there was, I remember, there was a sign. I, I have to believe. I think it was like just at the entrance or the back of Dinoland, which there was a, um, it was a take on sort of the old fifties B movie monster movies. It was called "It Came Through the Drive Through," and it had right. sort of a big dinosaur going over what looked like the original, uh, the original McDonald's from the fifties. And, and, and that artwork was done by. Uh, uh, William Stout, who is a very famed dinosaur artist, he also did that other uh, poster where that one dinosaur was eating another dinosaur, and it uh, "Have you had a crocodilian today?" <laughs> right. uh, uh, for that, and and let's not forget uh, Countdown to I- Extinction, where you had the red pipe and the yellow pipe and the white pipe, and on it it had the uh, uh, chemical compositions. Uh, for ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise. Mm-hmm. Which is still there. I mean, as you go into the queue yep. and you make your way downstairs to the loading area, if you look up uh, to the ceiling, you'll see those pipes. Um, so, look, Jim, I mean, you know, 22 years later, there's a lot of Disney's Animal Kingdom that still remains, and there's a lot of things that have gone, like the dinosaurs and McDonald's, that have gone extinct um and you know despite some of the very public backlash that the park got um not just from guests but even you know the new york times and and called it you know just another you know um you know another amusement park and it was you know it it was a lot of the although there were real animals there they talked about some of the things that were artificial from the tree of Mm -hmm. life to some of the other things we talked about you know PETA and things like that. But I think, you know, very quickly that public backlash died off. And I think as people started to understand Animal Kingdom, they really came to appreciate Disney's Animal Kingdom. And we talked about how at the beginning it took some time to get sort of acclimated to what that park was. I think for some people, too, it quickly became their favorite park. And I think that there's still to this day is is as a local when we go to the parks we we go sometimes for different reasons animal kingdom still has such a different feel to it it's the place that i don't necessarily go to ride anything as opposed to just i'm going to just go when i say wander i mean eat but you know what i mean i'm going right. to just wander <laughs> and explore my way and i love 
the nooks and the crannies and the education that is not thrust upon you, it really does, and I'm going to bring it full circle back to Walt, I think it really embodies that spirit of edutainment that Walt had always wanted and strived for. Well, and, and, and again, you know, it, 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 it's uh, odd that we can talk about uh, food at, at a theme park, and I think the food at all of the Disney theme parks are, uh, there's outstanding examples, you know, and you never would have thought of an amusement park as, as being known for, for food. But Animal Kingdom in particular has some, some wonderful, wonderful uh, offerings. And, and in fact, when Camp Mickey, uh, Minnie Mickey uh, was up and running, you could get funnel cakes there. And I'm a big funnel cake fan, um, which is low end there, there, you know, you've got Tiffins and you've got all these other things where, you know, um, it's just outstanding, but but I think what was very uh, eye-opening was what you said in the first part of uh, uh, the, that we did a, a week ago was that uh, Animal Kingdom is the type of park where you need to slow down and just sit and look, you know. And uh, I, I think that makes an, an awful lot of sense in terms of. Uh, uh, enjoying it rather than running yourself ragged to try and ride uh, uh, Expedition Everest, you know, five times and complain about the Disco Yeti. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. We talk about how it's a park that's meant to be slowed down and savored. And as we were talking about food, I just remembered there were no table service restaurants that were open on opening day. No, no. So it, 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 uh, un- unless you counted uh, um, uh, Rainforest, Rainforest Cafe yeah. on the outside of the park. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, look, I I think, you know, as we sort of end with this 30,000 foot view, I mean, it really is a park that was just, you know, epic in terms of the scale and the scope of what they wanted and expected this to be. We talked about the incredible um, engineering and planning that had to happen in order to make this happen. Um, And I and I. I'm curious for people who are listening where Animal Kingdom for them fits in terms of their favorite park. You know, where does it sort of rank in terms of their scope? What are the things that they love and appreciate uh, about this park that truly is, you know, not just noble in its concept and its mission, but I think really epic in terms of its scope and size. And and you and I have spent three hours now talking about <laughs> an Animal Kingdom, and we it, it's still only the tip of Expedition Everest. There, you know, there, there's still so much more to be said and uh, and appreciated uh, uh, about that that park. And and thanks again, as always, for the opportunity to uh, share some of this with. Uh, uh, your listeners, it's, it's always a joy talking with you, Lou. Not only have you always been a, a, a great friend, but uh, you're very passionate uh, uh, about all of this, and you're very knowledgeable, and, and you, you have those little bits that, that I, I've never known. So I always feel smarter after <laughs> we've done these podcasts. Well, this is always a meeting of the Mutual Admiration Society. You know I love and appreciate you, not just as a friend, but for the incredible knowledge and passion and incredible individual stories that you are able to bring as well, not just here on the podcast, but in your incredible uh, breadth and scope and library of work that you've done in terms of books that you've published. Uh, You mean all of those books that listeners could get at Amazon.com and ThemeParkPress.com? Exactly. (laughs) I'm going to link to all those books in the show notes this week um, because they are that good. And it's everything from the history and the secrets and stories, not just of the parks, but animation and Walt Disney and and everything in between. You are are the most knowledgeable person that I know. Um, Again, and it comes from such a wonderful place of, of passion as well. Well, I, I would have known a lot more about Disney Animal Kingdom if you had ever done that CD. <laughs> but, you know, what might have been. <laughs> I appreciate you, brother. We will, uh, we will pick up on this and talk about some more stuff that we have missed over at Disney's Animal Kingdom. And uh, I promise to buy you a funnel cake. Oh, terrific. Thank you very much.
It's time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week. I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World's history or see how well you pay attention to the details, sometimes what you see, hear, or even taste in the parks. If you think you know the answer, you can enter via our online form for a chance to win a Disney prize package. Of course, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, in anticipation of this week's show, I asked you to tell me what was the name of the unique, clearly, yet short-lived opening day parade in Disney's Animal Kingdom. As you just heard, it was, of course, March of the Artimals. And like we said, when the park was really in the final stages of their development and concept phases, the producer, Douglas May, wanted something to be a little bit different at Animal Kingdom, much like the park itself. So he decided to forego a more traditional Disney parade with characters and instead wanted to design a concept of the residents of Discovery Island, which was Safari Village, putting on a carnival. And that's why the costumes and the floats looked the way they did, and they were designed by Swiss artist Rolf Nee. And as we said, it was a little confusing, kind of quirky, but very lively. They tried adding more live music and a storyteller, didn't really succeed, and that's why the parade ended its run in June of 1999. Anyway, I took all of the correct entries. Thank you for entering, by the way randomly selected one and again last week you're playing for all my digital products which is my 102 ways to save money for an at walt disney world book all seven of my virtual audio walking tours of the parks look now we can't get to the parks i want to bring that experience to you it's as if you and i are walking through magic kingdom land by land shop by shop attraction by attraction all with the ambient binaural sounds behind you really talking about some of those history details and stories again you can find the book and the audio tours in iTunes and on the WW Radio shop at www.radio.com. I'm also going to send you a vinyl sticker, a WW Radio Magic Band cover, and a mystery prize from my collection, which I am currently purging on eBay at www.radio.com slash eBay. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is Molly Page. So, Molly, I have your address. Because you use the online form, I will get your prize package out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay. Because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So we're going to stay in Animal Kingdom. We're going to stay in Animal Kingdom's early history with a simple question, which is to tell me what was the original name of the attraction that's now known as Dinosaur. The attraction originally opened with a different name, but it was changed in May of 2000 to be a companion to the new Disney film, Dinosaur, along with a few other changes as well, which I'll tell you about next week when I give the answer. So tell me, what was the original name of the attraction now known as Dinosaur? You have until Sunday, April 26th at 11.59 p.m. to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there, and again, you're going to once again play for all my digital products, the vinyl sticker, the Magic Band cover, and a mystery prize from my personal collection. So... Before I wish you good luck and to have fun. Speaking of the, my collection, again, visit www.radio.com slash eBay. Ten new auctions each and every week. And if you love playing trivia, be sure to come over to my Instagram at instagram.com slash Mangello, as I'll be sharing a new Disney trivia question, multiple choice trivia question, every single day on my Instagram stories. Again, it's instagram.com slash Mangello. So now, good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so very much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. Just a couple of quick reminders. Please come and join the community and conversation over on our Facebook group at www.radio.com slash community. Talk not just about this week's show, but any other show episodes. There's contests, conversations that you could be a part of or start on your own. It's fun, family-friendly, and of course, 100% drama-free. Also, don't forget to join us every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern for WW Radio Live. That's my live video broadcast and conversation on Facebook. Be part of our Top 5 Live, where you can make and share your own list, call in, be part of the conversation, and play in our 20 Questions Contest. Again, that's every Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern at www.radiolive.com. And speaking of community and thanks, and really you're more like family than anything else, I want to thank all the members of the WW Radio Nation family for your love, your support, your friendship, and help. And I love also being able to give 
back to you each month. I want to thank some of the new members who've joined, the hundreds of you who are part of the Nation family, including Ranch, happy birthday, by the way, Chris, Heather Brookshire, Howie Herman the Fourth, Karen Azell, and Susan Thompson. Thank you, thank you so very much. If you want to find out how you can not only help the show, but also get exclusive rewards every month, including scavenger hunts, we have a private Facebook group, custom Magic Band covers, logo gear, t-shirts, backpacks, care packages from Walt Disney World, and our exclusive live monthly group video calls and lots more. You can visit www.radio.com slash support. Don't forget that a portion of your proceeds, which, by the way, are completely optional, of course, do go to our Dream Team project to directly benefit the Make-A-Wish Foundation of America. And again, this idea of us being one community, this show is by, for, with, and about you. So I'd love to hear from you. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on the air, you can email me, lou at www.radio.com, or call the voicemail at 407-900-9391 with a question, a comment, or just to say hello. You can also connect with me elsewhere on social. I'm at Lou Mangello on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and also be sure to like and share the WW Radio page on Facebook at facebook.com slash WW Radio. Of course, right now we can't do our meets of the month in person, which is why this month we're going to do another virtual meet of the month, not in Walt Disney World, but in your living room online together. That's going to be this Sunday, April 26th at 7 p.m. If you go to the events page at www.radio.com slash events, you'll find out how to RSVP and be part of our next virtual meet of the month. Again, we can't get together in the park, so I'm always going to make lemonade from lemons and we're going to have fun getting together online. Speaking of lemonade from lemons, look, I think that right now we have great opportunity to really take the time, which sometimes we don't have enough of, to turn what we love into what we do. I want to help you any way that I can, whether it's one-on-one virtual coaching online. We're just about to start our next weekly mastermind group, which is going to be Tuesday night at 7 p.m., limited to just six people. We only have two spots left. I can also present to your business, your school, or your conference virtually. And I have my two Momentum events coming up later this summer will be my Momentum Weekend Retreat. And this October 17th and 18th is my fifth annual Momentum Weekend Workshop in Walt Disney World. One room, 50 people, real world speakers who have walked the walk, built on inspiration, education, and community. It's unlike other conferences because you're not going to just learn, but share, discuss, troubleshoot, and make real changes to your life, your brand, and your business. To learn more and find out how I can help you in any way, please visit lumangelo.com. Huge, huge, now more than ever, thanks to Becky Mankin and the entire amazing team over at mousefantravel.com. When this is all over and we're able to travel again, whether you're going to a Disney destination or anywhere on the planet, let Becky Mankin and her entire team of amazing agents help you plan and book your next vacation. Their services and their people are amazing, and they all come at no cost to you. Again, you can visit them over at mousefantravel.com. And as always, my friend, and you, I mean it now more than ever, you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not. And if so, I cannot wait until we finally can. If you like the show, please Help spread the word. Let others know about it in the best way that you know how, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or if you can, take just a couple of seconds to rate and review the show over in iTunes. It's incredibly helpful. I want to thank a couple of recent reviewers like Snow White Bell, who's, I know, Tacey from Canada. She says, OMG, Lou, write the book. I just listened to show 579. Been a listener since the old podcast days. Tacey and I go way, way back. This one is by far my favorite you've ever done. I love the ability for Disney to storytell, and I learned so much backstory that you went into details about the founding members of the Adventures Club, what attractions are linked to, and where in the parks all over to see references. You must write a book complete with photos and maybe even sound files for, the, for a digital book for those of us who want to go exploring to capture all these things. I can't imagine the people that are going to want to touch the Jungle Book novel, for example, to find the hidden room and so many more. If you're looking for a true Disney expert, look no further. Subscribe to the podcast. Learn everything others there is to know worldwide about the brand. Thanks for another amazing show, Lou. Thank you, Tacey, again, for your years of your friendship, love, and support. Skate Skater number seven says, The world's best podcast. Lou Mangello and all of his guests are always a treat to listen to every week. Lou really does bring the magic of Disney to wherever you are every week. The show will not disappoint. Marla, oh, I love Marla from California, says, Consistent content from the heart. I've been listening to W Radio since prior to 2015. It's been a while since I left a review. 
Content is filled with so many different topics to listen to, whether it's as a getaway temporary from life or to help you plan future adventures. The podcast and host is consistent. Content is from the heart. I love listening to the recent Kona Cafe Dining Review. I've dined there before, but that podcast had me scrambling for a last-minute reservation for an upcoming trip I had with two friends. Yes, I also added a Tonga Toast for the table. It's one of the reasons why I love Marla. I learned from the best now listening to the podcast on New Orleans. I want to try and find a cruise buddy, but no matter what your focus is, to just enjoy the entertainment you're listening to or to help you decide on upcoming adventures, WW Radio is the best. Piloted by Lou Mangello, you know you're in for an adventure. While you might be hungry for a meal after each podcast, your heart will swell with contentment with the fun you are listening to. I'm grateful. Oh, you Marley, you're going to make me cry. I'm grateful to be part of this community. No matter what level of involvement, all are left feeling welcomed. Continued hugs to all. Marla, I'm going to end with that one. I love and appreciate you, Tacey, everyone else who's left a review. Again, just search for WW Radio in iTunes or just go to www.radio.com slash iTunes for a direct link and instructions on how to write a review. Finally, again, I know these are tough unsettling, scary, and sometimes even lonely times. You are not alone. Um, You are my friend. I am with you, and I hope that these shows and the live video and the Instagram posts and everything else just makes your day a little bit happier, and maybe, just maybe, even inspires you to be better. And if I can help in any way, I mean it when I say, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I am your friend, and I'm here to help you however I can. Stay safe. Stay positive. I love and appreciate you. And I miss you, too. So until next time, see ya. Hey, Lou. Ben Burke from Charlotte, North Carolina. February 8th. I am uh, I was out doing my long run today, doing nine miles. Uh, but then it sat, decided to snow. So I uh, did a quick three. And now I'm going to head to the gym and do my finish my six because uh, nobody knows how to drive. And... Uh, there's no good places to run except around the road. So, uh, snow scares people in North Carolina, and uh, I don't want to be one of those people that scares them. Anyway, just finished listening to the top 10 resorts. Love it. I'd like to say all the resorts. I think my favorite and nostalgic is probably Port Wilderness. Uh, I think it's great. Love it. Um, I always dream about just staying there and uh, not, never really going to the parks, just hanging out there. Bonfire, golf cart, trails in for uh, brunch, trails in for dinner, trails in for breakfast, and then maybe uh, trails in again. So, uh, anyway, hope all is well, and uh, look forward to the next show. Uh, if you have any extra slots for Louisiana and uh, that cruise, let me know. Thanks. Good afternoon, Lou Mangiello and WW Radio community. It's longtime listener, Justin Bobinski. I hope everything is well and safe for you and your family. I just listened not too long ago, or maybe if it was show number 478, if my memory serves me right, about the New Orleans trip. And one more question that I should get to you is, when is your next audio walking tour? To Walt Disney World. You did Magic Kingdom. All you have left, all you have to do now is just put into Epcot into different separate audio tours like Future World and World Showcase since Epcot is under the transformation. Hope you have a nice weekend and most importantly, do a little something entertaining at home. See you next Sunday on the virtual meet. Take care of yourself, Lou, and each other. As always, you say. Thank you.